Instructional Designers in Offices Drinking Coffee is brought to you by Domino, makers of Domino One, the all-in-one cloud-based e-learning authoring tool for teams. You can learn more at domino.com. Now, here's this week's episode. How many of you are clapping at home? Come on now, you can tell us. Good morning, folks. Whew, good morning. Yeah. It's Pavlovian. Every time I hear that music, I need to drink coffee. I don't. Know All I want to do is just j- grab my cup right there. Which cup might you ask? Oh, this one. This, yeah. this one. <laughs> the famous blue <Lou> mug. <laughs> oh, hello, gang. Jennifer says she's got her to- toes tapping. Lane says she's snapping over here. That's awesome. Nice. Very, very beat poetess though. <laughs> Chill, you know. There we go. Oh, is that becoming kind of a generational thing? Do the kids today know about beat poets? Yeah. With their berets, hard to say, and their turtlenecks. I remember that from Gilligan's Island. When. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> oh my! There's a. There's Are we a dating kid. ourselves? No kidding. <laughs> no kidding. The great reveal. It turns out. <laughs> We've been around for a while. So, yeah, yeah. I, you know, no we, we pretend we're all young and everything, but, uh, you know, speaking of young and wonderful guests, Chris, who's <laughs> hanging out with us today? <laughs> Friends, we have fun. Wow. <laughs> I needed that, Brent. Thank you. Uh, we have Keith Stoneman with us here today. Keith, it's your first time joining us, so introduce yourself to our gang. Here. Yeah, you bet. So I've been an L&D professional for over 30 years. I started as a high school teacher. I taught high school mm-hmm. physics in Queens, New York. I have some great stories about that. A few years later, got into training world, and it's been my career ever since. And so worked at a variety of different companies and different industries. Largely, my experience is in operations training, which is what I do now, so either like customer service, um, or sales um, type of, of training work. So usually in a business line um, type of thing like that. So mm-hmm. currently work for Pen, Pen Fed Credit Union. And uh, I'm talking to you today from Lincoln, Nebraska. Um, although I usually work in Omaha, so. Mm-hmm. Big, Is that a long commute, commute for you? It's about an hour each way, each day. Mm-hmm. So, wow. but yeah. My average speed, my car tells me, is 56 miles an hour for the entire trip, both ways. So it's not too bad. <laughs> nice. You get to listen a... to some podcasts. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Fill your time. ITM, Brent. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, there you go, brother. <laughs> ITM. Yeah. Um, uh... We should probably point out, you mentioned you know operations training. And, and yeah. just to make sure, for those of us who are older in the crowd and a little bit, maybe a little confused, that doesn't involve that that game with the tweezers, right? That's, that's, that's not <laughs> no. what you're talking about? <laughs> no. Okay. okay. Yeah. Right. I, I don't think that I do well in medical training or anything related oh, yeah. to that. I Yeah. I do not have a stomach for that. I highly respect those folks, but that's not my thing. So, yeah. Yeah, you know, a little bit of coffee helps really steady the nerves when you're playing that game. <laughs> <laughs> you bet. You, you, have you watched any of our episodes where we talked about um, uh, folks transitioning from teaching into l and I mean... I have, actually. And, you know, I've helped some folks along my career. It can be a great way to do that. You know, some people can make that transition. Some people aren't able to. Um, with it, I think, you know, the key there is the transition from when you're an educator in a school, it's learning for the sake of learning. You're learning concepts. You know, l d is really about performance. You know, and I always talk about there's three things I always tell my team and my stakeholders. Three questions we got to answer. What do they need to do? What do they need to say? What decisions do they need to make? And by putting it at that really simple level, that's a huge difference from, 
okay, we're going to learn arithmetic today, or we're going to learn parts of speech today, or things like that. Sometimes you need those things to get to those three, but that's really where it is. If we can't answer those three, if we can't help people get to those three, then we're not doing what we're asked to do. And it's a great segue into our, uh, our, our topic today in, uh, you know, just following your career journey. I'll, I'll kick us off a little bit today and just say how wonderful it is and how much I appreciate you for being here with us today and talking. I, I, you and I spoke yesterday and I was yeah. telling you, I, I, I love talking to other practitioners who are out there doing the work. You know, we often mm-hmm. have... Um, you know, educators and other folks that are fantastic. I love having them on the show, consultants and contractors and whatnot out doing work also, but it's different, right? And so getting, getting other professionals in here to talk about their journey, Mm -hmm. to talk about the work that they do, I think is so incredibly valuable. And it's, it's hard for me to find people willing to come in and talk about that journey, but, um, you've taken a very, uh, a, a very, uh, I want to say structured, but maybe not uh, an interesting path in your success. And, and the yeah. thing that's cool about it is, is that you've got, um, you have an ability to reflect on it and to see where kind of where you went, mm-hmm. maybe went wrong in the past, where, you yeah. know, what are, what are some of the things that you learned along the way? So that's mm-hmm. what we're going to talk about today or what, I, what yeah. I'm, where I'm hoping our conversation will take us to those of you in the chat. If you want to just drop in questions for Keith along the way, that would be awesome too. So you bet. So, and I'm going to yeah, give so, a shout out to Kim Whiteside, who I saw in the chat there, fellow L&D professional in Omaha. Hey, Kim, good to see you in here. So <laughs> nice. I wonder how big the community of L&D pros in Omaha, Nebraska is. It's pretty sizable. We have a really strong ATD chapter. We've got great people and great, great leadership here. And so, yeah, cool. we're fortunate to have that. That is awesome. So, all right, let's do this. Let's just, let's jump right into the content. And then if we get to the end and, and give all of the great five key tips, uh, yeah. you know, too soon, then we'll have some time for some extra Q and A. So sure. I've got you this, bet. I'm going to fire up this screen share yeah. here and, uh, you know, what I'll do is, um, I'll just let you, uh, let you start, but what I'm sure. How can I so let's go to the next slide, Brent. Yeah. That's just the title slide that I put in here, sure. if you would. There we go. Okay. So let me explain this. this. <laughs> <laughs> and for every L and D professional, this is your problem. And I laugh because I was with a vendor one time and we were learning uh, customer journey mapping. And I said, every senior executive is looking for the magic binky or that pacifier that you see in the photo. And he said, what do you mean? And I said, somebody's screaming in their ear, whether it's a board member or shareholder or a customer, whoever it is. And then they're yelling in the ear of your EVP or VP. And then they're yelling in the ear of your manager, which then comes to you. And your thing, just like when you give that pacifier to a child, anybody who's had a child knows this, is you know really that can really change things with that child and that's really what your senior executive wants make this pain go away and so i kind of wanted to start there with it because to me really thinking about that i think really changes what your executives are looking for and on the journey really helps you frame because if you look at things in terms of problems and solutions and what you deliver, that's what your executives are looking for. Help make this problem go away. So that's, that's where I wanted to start. Hmm. And, and so when you're, when you're, when you're giving them the pacifier, do you dip it in whiskey first? What's the, what's the, what's the approach with that? <laughs> Probably should. It was really funny. <laughs> at, the, at the end of that workshop, it was funny. The vendor, the next day, he brought me a package of binkies and he was like, <laughs> I am never going to forget this. He's like, I'm going to start using this in my classes. I said, Hey, go do that, you know, kind of thing. But for a long time, I had that at my desk, you know, and people would be like, what's up with the pacifier? And I'm like, it's a visual reminder. <laughs> Indeed, I guess you keep a jar of them on our desks as L and D professionals, and every time somebody comes by that uh, yeah. requesting training without any other information at all, you just hand them yeah. one of those. 
<laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Oops. All right. All right. So, so we got five key concepts that we're going to talk about today also. Yeah. When, when Brent invited me on, I kind of thought about the L and D journey and some of what he and I had talked about and really boiled it down to, to these five items that I thought could help this audience. So first off, have an executive sponsor. Um, we'll talk about that in more detail. Um, use your updates to educate key leaders and stakeholders. So a little bit at a time. So we'll talk about that in more detail. Demonstrate you're using everything you have before you ask for more. Good SME content plus good L&D practice means great results. And then finally, better 80% done than perfect. So let's dive into each one, Brent. Yeah, that's a that's a, that's one of my mantras. I, I you know, done is better than perfect. I always right. say too. <laughs> but we'll get to that one. All right. All right. So having an executive sponsor, I think most everyone knows about this. If you've ever worked on a project, you know, with an agile team, whatever, it's always who's the executive sponsor and all that. To me, it's got to be more than just a title. Do you have someone who's going to advocate for you? And, and I can't tell you across 30 plus years of my career, the difference that it makes to have a good, strong executive sponsor and not having an executive sponsor. So I'm going to go the negative route first. I remember vividly one time there was a VP that I worked with. She knew she needed more training resources in her area. And she was like, hey, would you go with me to this other senior leader and help make this presentation and do it? Kind of worked on it. We talked about it together. We went to that senior leader and the senior leader was like, what are they going to do when the training's done? Like it was a one time event. And I remember trying to explain to this person and I said, don't we add new products and change procedures and processes? We've never gotten a new IT system, right? You know, kind of all this. And literally the senior executive couldn't get it. Needless to say, the VP did not get the resources. I've had other times in my career where I've been very fortunate to have the advocacy of a senior executive who, um, who not only advocates for you, but supports what you're doing. I've been lucky twice in my career to have senior leaders who are intimately familiar with L&D practice. I remember one that I met and the first time I talked to him and I said, so what does good training look like to you? And he said, I'm all about terminal performance objectives and writing training that delivers those. I about fell out of my chair. <laughs> Um, yeah, I had how another often one. do you run into a senior exec who knows yeah. that, right? <laughs> yeah. I had another one that I had to think about performance support on my desk. I had a book um, on my desk. Um, I think it was Allison Rossett's book. And he looked at it and he goes, what do you know about that? And I said, well, I studied in grad school. It's something I'm very passionate about, you know, this whole bit. And he goes, I wrote my PhD dissertation on that. And I was like, okay, cool. <laughs> um, don't hear a lot of that too. Oh, yeah, so. Yeah, so those are two of the really good ones. So having that or finding that person makes a huge difference in your journey. If you've got the first one I talked about, I mean, that was an uphill battle the entire time in that organization and that division that I worked with and in. The other ones I've talked about, I mean, you don't get everything you ask for, but it's really so much easier and better to, you know, to know that you have that support when you ask a question, they understand why or they're behind what you can deliver. Sometimes you've got to earn that support over time, and that's something you have to do too. I always tell people, you know, good results earns you the right to, you know, to do more and to ask for more. And that kind of goes with the one about doing everything that you have with what you've got now. You know, all of this falls under the category, I think, of, um, they, Adam mentions it too, right? Doesn't doesn't that apply to all corporate? Yeah, and it got me thinking about what we're really talking about today here is uh, learning and understanding business acumen, yeah. right? It's, it's not mm -hmm. just about being a fantastic and great instructional designer. As you get into corporate and you get into, you know, that, that space, the world of business, and you're dealing with executives and you want to yeah. move up the, the chain, Right. right. You, you have to learn all this stuff. So um, my my next question to you, and I don't want to dwell on this number one for too long, but sure. I think this might help set the stage for the next four also. Uh -huh. And that is at what point when you made that transition from being a teacher into that corporate mm -hmm. space, 
did you start realizing and start thinking about, hey, there's this business side of the world that I need to start you know, connecting with and, yeah. and, and, and shift my thinking and, and learning some of this business acumen and how to talk to them. How, you sure. know, did, did it occur overnight or, you know, how did that happen? So I was probably luckier than most. So if you've read my LinkedIn uh, summary, you'll notice, I say that um, I first did training when I worked in a pharmacy in high school and we got a computer system. So this is about 1982, 83 computers weren't nearly as prevalent as they are now, and they were more complicated to operate. And I remember the staff was significantly older than me, and the pharmacist who I worked for, it was a single store kind of thing. Um, he was like, hey, you know computers, can you teach everybody this? Yeah. And so I'd already had an entree to it with that, and a couple other things that I'd done too. So what happened was when I left teaching, I thought I was gonna stay in teaching actually. Um, I left my teaching job to go to graduate school. Instead, we found out we were going to have a kid, had two more. Graduate school didn't come for 10 years. By that time, I'd been in corporate for, you know, 10 plus years. And I was like, I think I want to stick with corporate training as opposed to education. So, you know, some of it was gradual because that was a bit of a tug of war, Brent. But I think it was kind of baked into me because I remember the first training job I got, I interviewed for, and my director, I think she had identified me for it because of my teaching background. Um, and I was speaking to performance and different things already um, intuitively. And I, I, you know, some of that too, I'll attribute to my dad. I laugh. I didn't realize I went into the family business. My father was an um, instructor for the Washington, D.C. Uh, police department. Um, for 15 years of his career and it took me a long time. And finally my, you know, my wife was like, well, don't you realize you went into the family business? And I was like, oh yeah, I guess I did. So I'm sure that some of that. You realize you've you become too. your dad. Oh, many, many times. <laughs> Scary thought. All right, let's move on to the next one. Okay. Cool. So using updates to educate key leaders and stakeholders. So one of the challenges I think we find as L and D practitioners is, we want to use lots of terms and words that are specific to L and D and things that we know are important, but to the average lay person or the average, you know, coworker doesn't matter so much. I often tell people, I say, everyone thinks they're an education expert in the United States because they have sat in a classroom for at least 12 years, most of us 16 years. So we think we're experts on what that means. Um, However, a lot of the things that we know and understand and do, we've got to educate our stakeholders. So like one job, it was like, well, we need time to write lesson plans. And my leadership was like, well, what do you need to do that for? And I said, well, if we want consistency, you know, we've got six different people training classes, um, you know, and at that time we were using just an outline to train from. It was like, hey, on day four, talk about these, you know, bullet items. And, and that was it. And so trying to do that or why we needed scripted role plays or, you know, activities and, in and, and, you know, job aids and things like that. So, you know, to me, updates are a great way to do that where you can give them that, you know, it's kind of that um, drip strategy. You can give them a little bit at a time because that's what they can handle. You can also help them to understand those things and the value of it um, in doing that. And so that makes a big difference too, because we all, you know, I'll use a different example. I went to a presentation recently. It was all about design. It was kind of a one hour thing on design and why we're going to redesign this website. For some people, I'm sure they needed that. Some people were like, okay, what are you going to do and why? You know, just like, hey, get to the point, you know, kind of thing. And so we need to remind ourselves of that. So those updates are a great time to do that. Not only are you going to show progress in what you're doing, but it also helps open that up. And when you have those questions about um, why do we need those things, you know, what, why do you need time to do that? Because, mm -hmm. um, you know, one leadership I was in thought was if a trainer wasn't in the classroom training people all the time, like 100% of the time, their time was not being used well and wasted and trying to understand <laughs> that, you know, yeah. instructional design, other aspects as well. So, Has yeah. it, 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 Oh, go ahead, Chris. 
Oh, I was just going to say, I mean, uh, as you say, so many people assume they know what learning looks like because of that, you know, that classroom experience. Exactly. Uh, they they don't realize the, um, you know, the feet of the duck. They see the duck, mm -hmm. but they don't see the feet. You know, they've never even understood that there's feet below the duck, let's say. Um, and and you know, that's a constant kind of um, challenge that I think everybody in, in, in our space finds is we have this body of, of knowledge um, and, you know, best practices, those sorts of things. Um, and being able to explain that and talk to people outside of our space um, really, uh, I mean, it's crucial to making sure that the organization understands our, our value, right? It's yeah. um, they, like, here, here's the power, here's a bunch of info, turn that into a PowerPoint and, and take right. it. Okay, yeah. well, maybe, or maybe, you know, yeah. maybe, maybe what's really needed is something is something else, etc. Yeah. You know, but we all do it. So many folks anyway, you know, we have all, yeah. as you said, had an experience of of, uh, of being educated so that mm -hmm. our, our, you know, we already know everything on that front. And it's such a critical part of, of, of what we have to do in L&D is to make sure that we are, um, that, that balancing act, as you mentioned as well, of, of not just helping people understand what we do, but trying to do it in a way that doesn't just involve our own internal L&D jargon, you know, because people don't have the, the you know, they don't have that dictionary, uh, you know, at hand uh, to be able to understand that, so. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, Christine, I see in that chat there, I fully agree with you. You know, as Chris said, that's a battle we fight every day. Mm -hmm. You know, and I laugh because <laughs> if you know somebody who's a surgeon, you wouldn't come to them and say, I want to come into your surgery theater tomorrow and tell you how to do this surgery, right? Your <laughs> operation thing, Chris. Right? I, I wouldn't pretend to do that in a heartbeat. I've and watched so many Grey's Anatomy episodes. I know what. Yeah, I know what exactly. Surgery, you <laughs> right. know, I, I, yeah. I, my <laughs> wife watch. You know, my wife and I. I watch uh, British police procedurals all the time, so I know what it's like to live in Wales. Or right? No, absolutely not. <laughs> and yet, people do that all the time. To Christine's point, and and part of it is helping people to understand. And and to me, that's where, you know, number four, the one we're going to come to after this about good SME good L and D practice. How do we marry those together? So yeah. we'll talk some more about that. There. And James has a great point in the, in the chat, just to sort of, I guess, wrap up this particular, basically mm -hmm. it's about increasing transparency in what we do, why yeah. we do it to increase trust from those who, who are sponsoring yeah. it. Yeah. Yes. The other thing you can tie to that is tie it to outcomes and results, mm -hmm. help people understand what the outcome, what the result is, and you got to get there first. So it's got to be sort of that future, you know, state and helping them understand we could be here if we do this. Perfect. Yeah. All right. So we're on to demonstrate you are using everything you have before you ask for more. This is one of mm -hmm. my favorites. Yeah. How, how, how did you figure this one out? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I laugh. So I've, I've worked part of my career in the non for profit sector. And I always laugh because, you know, the answer was, well, is it free? Can we get it for free? And my question is always, how much does free cost? So, you know, the joke I have for people, if you're having a problem with your Gmail account, you're not going to hear from a live person ever, right? You know, kind of deal. So back to this in that same way with that is you've got to show that you're using everything you've got right now to the fullest before you ask. So a lot of people, you know, they want new tools or different tools, you know, hey, if I had this video tool or if I had this authoring tool or, you know, I've only got this, I've got this. Sometimes you have to do horse trading. Um, you know, I had to do that in my current position. I want to get some additional tools for my team. And, you know, one of my senior leaders was like, well, what do you need that for? So I had to make that case, kind of educate a little bit. But then too, you know, he was like, okay, well, if I do this for you, you're going to give up this thing over here. So we'll do a trade. And I'm like, I can live with that. So, but demonstrate that using what you have to the fullest, because I think a lot of times back to kind of educating your leaders, they don't know. They don't know what the full capabilities of an authoring tool is. They don't know what the benefits are of those. So you've really got to show them that, hey, we're doing everything. You know, another way that I put this is that we're pedaling the bike as fast as we can. Right. You know, with it, it's everything that we have now, if we also had this, then we could do, you know, this other thing, or we could provide this, be able to do this. And so you have to make a case to demonstrate that because a lot of times, you know, every organization, everybody deals with budget stuff. <laughs> Sorry, my coworkers getting loud here. Um, 
He but, was agreeing uh, with you. Yeah, I don't know if that. Emphasis. I think it's more you're ignoring <laughs> me, Dad. But uh, anyway, um, you know, they have to see that you're using your tools that you have to the fullest and like what you've got. Um, sometimes, I mean, I laugh because people were like some of the tools I've used and, you know, across corporate and, and more of a general enterprise thing. And they're like, I didn't know that could do that. And I'm like, hey, we're going to, you know, um, and they're like, how, how could we do that, too? Yeah, and not even in an L and D environment. So with it. Yeah. Yes, Rachel, my coworker needs a pad. <laughs> I wish I had one. The, um, yeah, you know, your, your your image here being of, of a set of, of tools. Yeah. Um, you, you know, when, when you start having to have the discussions about something more, you know, needing to be added to the toolkit, you always need to focus on the problem, right? Here is the problem and here is the, you know, here is a tool that can help us fix yeah. this problem and then, mm -hmm. then ultimately is that problem enough of a pain that someone's going to agree that the solution is is the proper tool or here no no just use that old hammer that you've already got and and hit yeah. everything with it so well and you know there's consequences to that too so i like what tim said in the chat you yeah. know using opportunity costs to help understand too um you know, with that, but it's just really important that you demonstrate that and help your stakeholders see mm -hmm. that you're using what you've got to the fullest. Did, um, how did you get good? I'm going a little bit off track here, but okay. I, I, I like to tie this stuff, you know, back to, uh. to folks that might be trying to do this or might be struggling being a, mm -hmm. a training team manager and maybe they want to move up or maybe yeah. they want to engage with execs a little bit better. Sure. You know, how did you learn to, to, you know, get in the room with the business execs and talk to them and, and yeah. make that transition. Right. Cause I think a lot of times when sure. people are first getting into corporate or first moving yeah. up the chain, it's it's intimidating right These, yeah. a lot of business guys sure. and gals can be a little bit aggressive a little bit short they like to get to the point they're busy people they don't want to hear a lot of your ex explanations about what isd yeah. is and all that kind of stuff they just like what are you going to yeah. do for me today what do you need how can we get that for you you know and let's just cut to the chase kind of thing yeah. so you know how how did you how did you figure that out over the years sure. so kind of back to the pacifier thing um, you know, think like an exec, like a senior executive. Okay. So think like them and excuse me. <laughs> Go get that. Okay. Pardon me. Um, you got to think like an executive and what do they want? So think back to that. How do you make this pain go away? Okay, if I spend this, will I get this? And that's kind of you know what Tim was saying in the in the chat there with it. But learn to think like them. You know, I tell people the biggest difference between most of us that are either frontline or managers or things like that and senior executives. Senior executives are paid to make lots of decisions very quickly. Yeah. So what they want from you, what do I need to know? Give it to me in the shortest package possible. What's the decision I need to make and move on? OK, Perfect. and they don't want yeah. lots of details. So I always tell people, you know, and I, I've coached people on this and I've even had this in my own slides when I make presentations to execs. Super simple graphics, minimum, you know, use words if you must. OK, now beneath that, and I use this example. So in one of my uh, incarnations, I was a sales manager for a short period of time. I had to meet with the CEO and the CFO every month about my financials. And what I learned quickly, and everybody was like, oh, you gotta watch out, you know, the CEO is really tough. And I mean, he was, you know, both of them were, you know, they, they were very sharp business minds. If you knew your numbers, you knew your story, and you could articulate that, you were fine. If you doubted or you hesitated, if they asked you a question, hey, what are you charging for this? If you hesitated at all, they smelled blood in the water and they would start, and it was more, not so much that they were looking to be vicious, but it's like, okay, if you don't know this, what else don't you know about what you're doing? And so to me, you know, trying to give that minimum that I talked about in the slide, and I like what Adam said there, <laughs> minimum viable ask. That's awesome. Adam, I'm stealing that. Um, <laughs> but, but having that in the slide, but then I've got all the information at my fingertips to be able to drill down as far as they want to go cool. but generally they're going to want to keep it at a fifty thousand foot view 
I've got to know it at 10,000 foot or ground level with it, but you keep it there. Keep your ask simple. This is what I'm asking for. I need three licenses for this. It's going to cost this much per year with an ongoing cost of this. And it's going to allow me to do X. I love it. I love it. I love it. Yep. A good SME content plus good L&D practice equals great results. So this comes from something that I see that's extremely common, particularly in American business, which is that the way we pick the trainer or the manager or the next sales manager is, hey, who can knock out the most widgets in a day? Who's the best SME? That's great. They know all the ins and outs of that, but they generally don't have good L&D knowledge or practices. The problem for some of us who come from that educational side is we know that, but you got to learn the business. So I actually have a diagram. I didn't include it in here, but if you remember those Venn diagrams from your math days with two overlapping circles and sort of a moon-like shape in the middle where they overlap, one of those circles to me would be L&D. The other one would be business. The more you can overlap those yourself in your career and in your content, where you bring good L&D practice and you bring good SME information, that's going to create great results. The challenge that we have as educators and L&D practitioners is we want, we know what all that we need, you know, in terms of, okay, I need a lesson plan. I need these objectives and I need, you know, all this stuff and everything else. That's great. But if it doesn't deliver that business result and the challenge that I find sometimes, and I mean, this is a, I don't have a clean answer on this. Mm -hmm. My thing has been to dive as deeply as I can into the business as much as possible. Um, Now that was easier in different positions in my career where I was, you know, closer to more of an entry level trainer, you know, things like that. As I've gotten up the ranks, I've had to say, okay, I can't get this deeply into it. But when you're a frontline trainer, practitioner, you really have to have both of those in the same way. This is a question I love that I kept from my graduate education that we tossed about in one of my classes. Do you have to be a good trainer to be a good instructional designer? Do you have to be a good instructional designer to be a good trainer? Now, a lot of us, including I'm sure many who are in the audience here would say, well, they're two different functions, two different things, whatnot. But I think it it helps significantly in your results. Not that you have to be an expert in both, but if you can have a foot in each, and it's kind of a different version of the same thing, really makes a difference. Because as an instructional designer, if you know how things work in the classroom, right, that makes a huge difference. I think, you know, my son who's in the National Guard, he says, every operation has a plan. The plan is good until the first foot hits the ground in the scenario and then plans out the window but the values in the planning right not in the plan necessarily and i think it's that same thing here of Mm -hmm. being able to be in there see how this works because a lot of times i've seen instructional designers and then it's in the classroom it's like that didn't go like i think and then same thing trainers who are like why'd you design it like this but maybe don't have the instructional design piece so trying to bring those two together as much as possible. Yeah. And it, Working with SMEs is, is something, I mean, it, it runs back to that, everybody's experienced education. So we all, they all know what it, you know, what, what training should look like, et cetera. Um, you know, working with SMEs, but though, and filtering out, you know, what, what's needed to be known in order to change versus good to know info, all those sorts of things. Yeah. Um, and we've mentioned it several times in our, in different episodes, et cetera, but Kathy Moore's action mapping uh, yes. approach, starting with the business results, working back to what's the actions needed mm-hmm. to achieve the results, and then what information do people need to know? Um, it's a great model and it's a very, um, it, it's a very effective way to sort of communicate what you need to do when you start working with a SME who, you know, already has a vision of what training should look like, uh, you know, because of, uh, yeah. you know, hey, we're going to give them all this information wait a minute, we're going to give them the, the information they need to perform the tasks, et cetera. Yep. So I threw a link uh, into the to Kathy Moore's action mapping uh, into the chat there if, if folks are sure. interested in learning more about that. Very good. Yeah, I think, you know, we revere experts. It's especially a thing, you know, particularly in American business, but, you know, with that and that same thing, and I laugh a number of times. Um, so what do they need to know? Well, they need to know everything when right now can't can't do that got to parse it out we'll make that happen right away for you oh yeah (laughs) 
instant training. Just add water. <laughs> Flip the lid, pour it in, yep. put the lid back on. Yep. Yeah. yeah. All right. So we're at uh, number five. Another one of my favorites. <laughs> Better 80% done than perfect. And I, I know some folks uh, put some different versions of that into the chat too. So I think we should mm -hmm. preface this with, I'm fairly certain that somebody else more important than any of us has actually said this and it's gone yeah. down through the ages. So, uh, you know, kudos and credit to whoever originally said yeah. any version of this, but <laughs> it, it holds true. Yeah. I think the one I liked was George Patton's. I forget what the specific quote was, but a plan executed was better than a plan created or something along those lines. I don't remember specifically, but. Oh, I know which one you're thinking of. Yeah. I, I should have. Oh have man. It it'll, it'll come back to me. Okay. Yeah. But uh, no, you know, realizing, I, you know, so I'm Keith, I'm a perfectionist. Um, if we did hand raises in crowdcast, I'd ask how many people with me on that, but we know what our vision is like. And I know for me, that's one of the biggest things that I struggle with. I've got this picture of what the training should look like perfectly. The problem is we've got a deadline, we've got to do this. And I've seen, you know, there's two different versions of this. So one is delay, 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 which procrastination anonymous, that's me, you know, kind of deal. <laughs> I've had to fight that my whole career. The other version of this is, well, I can't do perfect, so I'm just not going to do it. Or I've seen other things like, well, in order to do that, we need three more FTEs, okay? And what I've found is, is that you say, you know, and the magic question, if, if you haven't heard this before, this comes from brainstorming, and I believe from um, IDEO, which is the design company out in Silicon yeah. Valley. The key question you start with is, how might we? That's the STEM, and then the question you're trying to answer. So that's where you start with the brainstorming, you know, to do that. How might we, you know, a lot of times, and I mean, we could have a whole nother, you know, conversation on this. Um, you know, the number of times I've been asked to compromise probably good L and D principles and different things, but I would rather deliver something that serves a need than to say, not going to do that. I mean, there are absolute times, and I mean, I laugh kind of back to, you know, educating your executives. So I had a situation a couple of weeks ago where we have this problem that we keep coming back to. And I was trying to tell one of the executives that I work for, and I'm like, okay. And I'm like, this is an example of Gilbert's six box model, performance model, if people are familiar with that. Um, I didn't call it that, but I'm like, hey, there's six factors in performance. One of them is training, you know? that might be a solution. This one is motives and systems. If we really wanna fix this problem, we need to address systems or we need to address motives. Now, that executive did not take me up on that, but this person has heard this from me over the last three years a number of times. I went, did the training, I warned this person and I said, do the training again. I said, I suspect we'll be here in another six months to a year. But I would have rather done that, delivered what was asked. I professionally did that rather than saying, nope, not doing that. Um, or here's why. I probably know, yeah, we'd get a better result if we did this, you know, with that. So yeah, I love that. Thanks to I love the oh, go ahead. STEM, this, the, the, that, that STEM, how might we, it, my version of that that I learned early, early on in my career in my very first legit L&D job was after me going on a very arrogant, egocentric, you know, defense of why my my yeah. idea and my plan was was perfect and what he was asking of me was sure. totally undoable. And I, got, I give major kudos to this manager for sitting calmly and letting me just go through my whole entire thing. And he just sat behind the desk and like, the question, and I will never forget this. And he said, he, all he did was just looked at me deadpan and just said, what can you do? You yeah. know, cause yeah. it, the request was, you know, can you have this done in a week? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And of course I was like, no, here's all the reasons why, here's all the yeah. instructional design reasons why and everything. And then uh, I told him all the things we couldn't do. And so his follow-up was, what can you do? 
And I, and so I was very snippy about the yeah. whole thing. And I just said, well, I could, you know, I could just, we could just do this and then just build this yeah. one thing. And I could probably have that by Friday. And he was like, excellent. Let's do yeah. that. And it turned out to be a fantastically successful project opened yeah. my eyes to a yeah. million different things about the real world. And it's, so it's yeah. kind of follows along the same uh, the same plan, but I think until people have that aha moment, mm -hmm. you know, you, yeah. you, you can, you can get caught in that trap of, if I don't get to make it perfect, I'll just go give the project to somebody else. And cause I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to have yeah. my name on that project. It's mm -hmm. totally beneath me. Yeah. I think too, it's kind of a variation of Carol Dweck's mindset, you know, paradigm, mm -hmm. um, you know, either growth, okay, can I do this? Can I change? Or do I have a fixed mindset that unless I have all these things or I can do this, do this, do this, you know, um, you know, and really looking in that way and challenging yourself there. I really like Adam's question in the chat, you know, um, yeah, where are opportunities, you know, and, you know, how do you list what those limitations are? And then, okay, what can we do within that? You know, what's, what's possible? So, you bet. Yeah. So do you feel like you're successful right now? Are you sitting on top of the world? Do you, have, you, you know? It depends on what day you ask, but you know, more often than not, yes. I, you know, I'm very fortunate the organization I'm in, my work is respected and uh, appreciated. I've got a great team that works for me. I'm very fortunate. I got 15 people. I tell people all the time that, uh, you know, somebody wants to point out my work or whatever. And I'm like, all I do is tell my team, let's go over here. What do you guys think? Let's do this. I got some ideas about it. They do fantastic work. And so I'm very fortunate in that way, my team that I have. And when I uh, came into PenFed and my organization, they were just, they were ready for it. Um, you know, it was the kind of thing where um, they wanted to grow, they wanted to learn, they wanted to do. And that's been a fantastic journey over the last three years with them. So yeah, very much where I'm at now. I could tell you about, you know, speaking of journeys, and I, I love that idea, you know, of a journey, um, because it's not the destination; it's the journey there. Some of my journeys have been really tough. Um, I'd say, you know, it was almost kind of like a, a time in the desert um, where you wonder, what am I gonna, you know, what am I doing here, and why, um, kind of thing with that. But those things pass too. You know, trying to figure out, am I in, am I on the right bus? Am I in the right seat on the bus, you know, with that and trying to figure those things out to Brent. But keep in mind, it's a journey. You know, I think about me going back to my story, started out as a high school teacher, um, then initially got into corporate training. After about three or four years, I decided to make it my career. Um, and to, you know, this is what I am going to do. And then I got my graduate degree really, you know, um, <laughs> I don't know if dug in my heels is the right terminology, but you know, like, Hey, th this is, this is kind of who I am. And that's another piece of it too, because, you know, I talk about, I often see two different paths with folks in training. So I think about a number of people that I've worked with great people, but training was a stop on their career path because they were like, Hey, I want to become chief HR officer, or I, you know, I want to move on to this other thing. And so training is a way to get there. And there's nothing wrong with that. I am really thankful for that because anybody who's been in training for a while. So I work with someone who's, um, you know, like an IT business analyst person right now. She used to be a trainer. She knows what it's like to stand in classroom. And that's fantastic to have her as an ally for me. So I'm thankful for those people too. Other people, I think about Brent, you and I, other people um, that we know, training is a career choice, and this is what I'm going to do. You know, hopefully, I go out with my boots on and the whole thing. <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, this has been an awesome conversation, Keith, and uh, and thanks so much for joining us. Um, I will say, here on Idiotic, we're never 100% perfect, <laughs> but, but when the clock comes around, we end up being 100% done. So. Uh, <laughs> Oh. Like a broke clock is right twice a day. <laughs> That's it. That's right. Every Indiana. Wednesday, we're, we're, we're right every Wednesday, 10 a.m. Eastern time. We may not be right, but we're right here, everyone. <laughs> every Wednesday. <laughs> every Wednesday. 
Keith, take uh, a minute and drop your contact info in the chat so we can oh, yeah. connect with you after today's after today's session. Um, wherever yes. it is that you want people to, yeah, uh, to, yeah, to connect with you, um, folks. Don't forget, we do have the LinkedIn um, uh, group in in Idiotic, and I don't know, Brent, are you being, you getting that one? You, you got that. You tossed that right in there too. And also, folks, don't forget. I mean, Idiotic is sponsored by Domino Learning Systems. If there's uh, uh, something that we can help you with, let us know. You can uh, join us on our website to sign up for a free trial, for example, of Domino One. Take a take that for a spin. See if that's something that can help your team. As you move forward. And it's not a big ask, it's a little ask. We, we can help you make the ask. <laughs> anyway, thanks everybody so much for uh, for joining us again this week and we'll see you all again next week. Thanks so much, Keith, for, for joining us. And uh, someday we'll get together and talk a little bit more about Mr. Springsteen. Yeah, there you go. I would love to do that, Chris, so. Brilliant. Perfect, thanks, Keith. Hopefully. You're awesome, yeah. my friend. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Brent. Thanks, gang. See you next Good time. times. Let's dance, dance out of here. Out. Oh, come on, Button. Should have brought my guitar up. There we go. Adios, everybody. All right.